Um, yeah, the national question then. So when I first joined uh, the IMT, our great organization, uh, the first Congress I went to uh, was all basically centered on the national question in Scotland. I felt uh, very special, I guess, uh, being uh, the, a new Scottish comrade. And as a result of this uh, Congress, which was in 2015, by the way, was uh, hands up, anyone else was there in 2015? There we are, brand new organization, just two of us, three of us in the room. Um, but as a result of this, the organization, uh, the organization split, in fact, in Scotland at least. Um, a minority, they broke away, uh, opposing uh, what they called our new Scottish turn, um, uh, recalling with this term the split of the militant in 1991 uh, over Peter Taft's, uh, his opportunist uh, adaptation, in fact, to Scottish nationalism, um, an attempt to uh, try and get a shortcut uh, to success, as, uh, his, uh, as he's known to do. Um, uh, to, to popularity by appealing to you know, Scottish nationalism, try and outflank the Labour Party or, or try and replace the Labour Party. Um, now these comrades who split away, they upheld uh, our old position um, of being uh, against uh, Scottish independence and uh, strongly against Scottish nationalism and strongly advocating the unity of Scottish and British workers um, um, uh, throughout Britain and uh, quite supportive of really the, uh, the, the reformist position, I think. Um, from the Labour left of, you know, Devo Max, Maximum Devolution, uh, Home Rule, if you will. Um, and I must say, at first, I find their arguments quite convincing. Um, kind of posing the, uh, the class struggle to, uh, to national struggle. Um, you know, the working class can be, you know, for one of the other. And that nationalism is always and everywhere, you know, an inherently reactionary thing that, uh, that dampens class consciousness. Um, but uh, the key questions of uh, Marxist orientation to a mass uh, national, nationalist movement. Uh, the relationship between the class struggle and the national question, all of that was drawn out at this conference uh, in 2015. Um, now, a split conference might not sound like the best uh, introduction to revolutionary politics. Um, but uh, I, and comrades at the time, certainly didn't think so. I imagine, I can't imagine uh, the comrades uh, who recruited me pulling their hair out thinking, oh my goodness, this is their first Congress and uh, everyone's at each other's throats about Scotland. Um, but it really was, I think, a very good uh, introduction to our tendency and to our organization. It was a very serious discussion, a very high level political discussion uh, and debate. And uh, it came ultimately to, of course, a resolution. It didn't drag on and on. Um, but the national question, they say, is uh, one of the most difficult problems for Marxists to master, really. And I think uh, in some regards that's true. I am still no expert, so I can't answer every question on every particular national, uh, national question. But um, I'll try, I think, today to give everyone uh, an introduction to a lot of the key ideas and concepts and the key approach of Marxists to this uh, problem. Um, it is difficult because it requires, I think, a real grasp of dialectical thinking, um, a real feel for the mood and level of consciousness of the workers in a given country, uh, and real revolutionary clarity in explaining our ideas and our position um, against all the, uh, the, the ephemeral and sort of secondary questions that are thrown up by, by the national question. Um, and the national question, it comes in so many forms. Uh, it's partly why it's so complex. We have examples that Marx and Engels dealt with, like Ireland and Poland, um, the, the, you know, the former kind of czarist empire that the Bolsheviks dealt with you know, in, in Ukraine, in Finland, the problem of, of the East, of, uh, of Muslim peoples in the East and their kind of national question, their, their national consciousness and so on, the desired form a nation state. And then other problems surrounding the First of War around Serbia and other small countries, small nations, and their place in the imperialist world system. And also slightly more peculiar forms of the national question, the question of Zionism is also a form of the national question, whether the Jewish people need a homeland of their own. Uh, the question of black nationalism in America, you know, do black people in America constitute a nation that should be separate from the United States and from the rest of the working class? All these kind of questions are very, very uh, complicated um, and require a lot of study. But the first thing I think to learn and to know about the national question, uh, as it is, is that it's concrete. It's a concrete question. There's no abstract position. We don't start from that about uh, you know, whether countries and nations, you know, should they be independent in general? Is that always just kind of a, a good thing, you know, on principle or something? Um, in Scotland, there's a popular kind of phrase used by Scottish nationalists, which I cringe at very much, which is that, oh, independence is normal, right? Independence is normal. Uh, well, for Scotland, it isn't, right? But uh, for a lot of other countries, uh, maybe so. 
Um, they'll say that, and they'll also say, oh, you know, like small countries, uh, you know, that, that are independent, they work better, you know? A bit of a repeat of this kind of capitalist mantra of like small is beautiful, you know, when they talk about small business. Um, but, uh, I mean, if anything, from our point of view, bigger countries are better. Um, we should be for the merger of all countries, really, if we take this kind of position, because in bigger countries, there's a larger working class. Um, it gathers them, uh, you know, uh, numerically in, in a bigger form, and um, uh, you know, for the in the struggle for power in each uh, in each country, it uh, it would be an advantage to have a large working class. Um, but this kind of answer that we're often hit with when it comes to you know uh, answers to you know what this problem of, of nationalism. Um, you know, people will often dig up this phrase, uh, you know, the workers have no country, you know. But this really is just uh, an abstraction to, to, to start at this point, start from there. Uh, it takes the working class, you know, as just this uh, homogenous kind of ahistorical category. And not as they really are, not as the conditions in each country really are. Because um, each national question is very much based upon uh, material and historic conditions. Uh, there's many sides to it that need to be, uh, need to be considered and, and understood in each uh, case. The class balance of forces in the country, the international balance of forces, um, the relative development of the productive forces, all of these things, they come into play when we think about the national question. And to forget all of that is really to just to kind of lose yourself a little bit and forget that the nation state itself is something that is a product of historical development. Obviously, Fiona covered this uh, yesterday. It's not something for all time. It's not necessary when we start discussing the national question or the, or the, the question of, of nations and nationalism to kind of define in a loose way what a nation is in this kind of way um, or create a kind of mechanical formula for answering the national question, which is what the Stalinists do. They have this just a uh, list of, you know, these uh, key features are what a nation is. If it has these features, then it should, uh, you know, we should support its right to self-determination, uh, essentially. Um, now the state itself uh, has existed for as long as class society has existed, um, but it's not until capitalism that we see the development really of the nation state uh, itself, the national state. And uh, nationalism, as uh, I'm sure everyone is aware, very much coincides with the bourgeois revolutions of the 19th century and earlier. Um, it was an ideological force used by the bourgeois to uh, unite uh, the population under their leadership and uh, to implement the program of the bourgeois revolution. Um, and we see that in Britain, in France, uh, in Germany, Italy, you know, the revolutions of 1848, uh, in America, the American Revolution, and so on. Now, the development of the nation, national state, the nation state, of course, um, creates the conditions for, for the flourishing of capitalism in a given country. You know, a unified national market, the elimination of local kind of feudal bylaws and feudal particularism and regulations, and uh, the equality of all property owners, you know, before the law, those kind of things. Um, and in this way, the creation of the nation state, it allowed for uh, a great revolutionizing of society and of the productive forces. It was a, a very progressive historical force, um, nationalism in a way. But is the nation state uh, progressive today? This is a kind of an interesting and key question, I think, to consider. Uh, I think now we have to say no, really. The nation state is very much a fetter on the future development of uh, the productive forces and of society. We are all witness to that, I think, over the past couple of years with the pandemic and everything, the, the total chaos that, you know, uh, individual nations uh, planning their own responses to the pandemic uh, caused. Um, and indeed, every capitalist crisis as well, you know, this uh, contagion that spreads from one country to another and they all try and protect their own interests and throw up trade barriers and so on and so forth, very much shows that uh, nation states today are, are, are kind of reactionary and, uh, and are fed on development, like I said. And uh, there's a key contradiction, really, in the world today, a major one, um, between the existence of nation states, uh, but the existence as well of a truly globalized uh, world market and world economy. Um, and the bourgeoisie can only ever temporarily overcome this um, limits with international trade blocks, things like the European Union and so on. But uh, the particularism and the competition of each national group of bourgeois inevitably reasserts itself. And in times of crisis in particular, that's why we see, you know, protectionism, you know, this crisis in the EU and so on. Um, it all goes to prove that capitalism itself, you know, is, is stuck at this stage of the, of the nation state, but it can't move beyond it either. Um, 
But taking all this, does this mean that we uh, disregard the national question of nation states and, and, and nationalism is, 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 uh, you know, in this historic epoch, uh, you know, uh, in an abstract sense, reactionary? Well, I think not really. Instead of all of that, it really only gets us to our starting point. Because the starting point for us as Marxists in analyzing any given national question is that uh, we are internationalists, that socialism is international, um, that we are for the closest international unity of the working class. Uh, opposed to the, uh, the exploiters, the exploiting classes of each and every country, uh, whether they be oppressed or, or, or uh, oppressor countries. And it's from this point of view that the national question uh, uh, has con concrete importance, really, for, the, uh, for developing a, a Marxist program, really. Um, and it's this uh, solid standpoint of, of socialist internationalism that, uh, that Lenin and Marx and so on uh, stood on, really. Um, because the, uh, but this, the, the socialist revolution itself begins with the struggle for power. And at first it forms, uh, it assumes a, a national form, you know, the struggle for power in one country before spreading uh, to others, typically. Um, you know, we can speak of a Marxist program in abstract, in the kind of general sense. But what really is needed is uh, a program uh, for, for a given country with a defined international context and international connections, um, with definite social conditions and contradictions in that given society. All that needs to be understood. Um, it's in this way that we analyze how the national question, where it exists, it doesn't happen uh, in every country, um, intersects with the class struggle in that country and also internationally as well, of course. Because as Lenin said, and as we all know from the quiz last night, the national question is at root a question of Bread. bread. And mean, he means by this that it can be an expression. It's not something that uh, cuts across or, or, or uh, abrogates or, or, or obviates the, the class struggle. But in fact, it can be an expression of class struggle, of the, uh, the underlying contradiction of capitalist society. Um, and the desire, really, for the workers of oppressed countries in particular, for freedom uh, and, uh, and to change society. Now, not all nations are equal. I'm oh, getting through this quickly, actually. Uh, not all nations are, um, are equal, of course. There are, there are strong and there are weak countries. There are oppressed and uh, oppressor countries. Um, and when we use these terms, uh, oppressed and oppressor, we don't always mean something so, so harsh as like the oppression, for example, you know, that Britain held over Ireland or anything like this. Um, more that we just mean that there is a, you know, a relationship of, of, of dominance, political and economic, between uh, other countries. So for example, when we talk about Scotland, Scotland was uh, never a colony of England. It was not, uh, it's not an oppressed country in that sense. But there is obviously this relationship of political and economic dominance by, by England uh, uh, in the Union over, over Scotland. Um, but in general, uh, it is the position of, uh, of oppressed nationalities that interests us, I suppose, the most. Um, and their movements for, for national liberation. Um, but uh, it's also the, 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 the duties of Marxists in, uh, in oppressor countries, and perhaps this is a bit more important for us, living in an imperialist country. Um, the, the duties of Marxists in oppressor countries are, are just uh, as important, really, or, or just as uh, important to cover. Because it was Marx and Engels, they both wrote that uh, a people that oppresses another um, can never be free itself. Um, that the, uh, the bourgeois reaction in uh, the oppressor country is, uh, is fostered by the national oppression that they visit on, uh, on, on the oppressed country, basically. Um, and Eng Marx and Engels, they wrote at length about how the, uh, the repression uh, and oppression uh, on the, uh, the Chartists and the, the early working class movement, the, all the techniques and all the, the boldness with which the, work, the ruling class did that, all that was uh, developed and based on the kind of oppression that they used uh, in Ireland. You know, he said, uh, it was Engels who said that um, it, was, uh, you know, it, it was based on the pale, this uh, kind of colonial uh, carving part of Ireland uh, around Dublin um, that, um, that uh, this kind of oppression was based on. Now, the bourgeois, they, uh, they sow uh, national hatred. You know, there's the nationalism, of course, of the oppressor country, which is certainly very reactionary. Um, and they sow this uh, you know, national hatred, essentially, and, and national uh, antagonism. Uh, in order to, to block uh, class consciousness, and in fact to, to maintain, of course, their, uh, their exploitation um, in, uh, in, the, uh, in, in both countries, in both uh, sides of the, uh, the oppressive uh, thing. Um, 
And Marx and Engels, they both very much dealt in their lifetime with the examples of, of Poland and of Ireland. They were the most kind of pressing ones for them and, they, and uh, for, the, for the first international, basically. And they dedicated a lot of time, uh, a lot of effort in passing resolutions and making sure that uh, the, qu the question, national questions of Poland and Ireland were, were debated and, uh, and well understood in the first international. Um, you know, they, they formally, and they, uh, the Marx and Engels, they, you see the, an evolution of their thought in how they write about these things. You know, formally, they had this kind of position that the liberation of, of Ireland and Poland from German or, or British uh, oppression would kind of come after the fact of a socialist revolution in these, in these countries, in Germany and in Britain. Um, as a result of the yeah, revolutions in the, in the advanced and dominant countries rather than these, these more backward ones. And in fact, there's, there's quite a lot of harsh words, in fact, that Marx uh, and Engels wrote about the backwardness of Poland and the backwardness of Ireland. Obviously, we know from Daniel's talk that uh, they were very much maintained in that uh, position by, by imperialism, by, by national domination. Um, but they, uh, oh no, they uh, changed their position, like I said, or their, their thoughts on this kind of question evolved. Uh, so when they saw how uh, hatred of Irish workers, this, this national hatred, um, really drove British workers into the arms of their own ruling class, that uh, this was a, a, a thing that was used very much to divide um, and, uh, and conquer the, ruling or the working classes uh, in Britain. And instead, they began to conclude uh, the opposite, and something that was uh, quite uh, I don't know, shocking to people at the time, that uh, in fact there really could be no successful socialist revolution uh, without the recognition of national liberation, uh, without the self-determination. In fact, uh, Marx basically said that it would, it would be a basic condition of the success of the British Revolution, or, 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 or even a beginning, that uh, Ireland would have its, uh, its freedom from British domination, essentially. That once that kind of great uh, you know, uh, ideological and, and, and you know, uh, social blockage was kind of removed, then uh, it would open up the path, basically, for British workers. Um, um, but until that day, it would always remain a, a kind of bulwark of reaction, essentially. Um, now, uh, Engels also wrote that a country uh, like Germany, or like England, perhaps, that uh, has oppressed you know, its neighbours for centuries and, uh, and gotten into the habit of it, really, they had to prove that they were really revolutionary. And that's what he meant by, uh, by this, uh, that this self-determination was a kind of precondition, really. Um, they can only really prove that they are really revolutionary, that the revolution has really begun, by, uh, by standing against uh, national oppression. Um, which we do, obviously, and uh, every Marxist kind of agrees on this, that we oppose national oppression, obviously, in a negative sense. But um, also the need to raise the positive demand of the right of self-determination up to and including separation. And this is the key thing of what the national question is really about. In Lenin's pamphlet, he is forced to kind of dance around the question because there are people who try to obscure it by saying, oh, the national question is about, you know, cultural you know, autonomy or, or other kind of things like this. But really, it's a question of the separation of nations, of, of kind of national independence movements and that kind of thing, uh, of self-determination. Right, this is all necessary, really, to, uh, to clear the decks. This is a phrase that Fred Weston very much uses a lot. Uh, but it's very, it's very, uh, it's very good. Um, it's very clear to clear the decks, really, of this uh, national animosity uh, and antagonism that exists between workers of oppressed and oppressor countries. Um, and uh, it's only uh, only through this this clearing of the decks that uh, the unity of the working class, the international unity of the working class, can really be brought about. Because as long as that uh, this national oppression exists, I mean, what, how can we really, in a concrete way, talk about the kind of uh, about um, the international working class and international unity, however. Um, and for the working class uh, of uh, an oppressed country, very much the same uh, uh, aim uh, is sought, you know, the unity of, of workers across uh, borders uh, and across uh, nations. And uh, in, uh, you know, oppressed, uh, you know, countries, it's the special responsibility of, of Marxists and of revolutionaries there to, uh, to combat the nationalism of their own bourgeois, their own uh, uh, exploiting kind of class. Because even in these oppressed countries, there is a bourgeois class. There is an exploiting kind of class. And uh, their nationalism, their desire for, for self-determination is really only an expression of their desire to, to carve out their own unique fiefdom 
on which to, to have uh, you know the to have uh, all the spoils of, of exploitation rather than um, give over a great part of it to their uh, you know uh, imperialist uh, you know, masters or whatever it might be. Um, and we do this, and we have to uh, in, in these uh, countries you fiercely uh, oppose the uh, the kind of class collaborationist uh, tendency of um, of nationalism of, of kind of the oppressed countries. Very much uh, it very much exists obviously in in Scotland uh, and other places. And in uh, in these oppressed countries, we need uh, really to uh, to explain to the working class there that uh, in many ways the, the that national liberation under capitalism and uh, in in the world of imperialism um, will only will largely be be an illusion. Really, you know, you can be an independent country, but you can't really escape uh, the the dominance of imperialism. There are other ways that uh, uh, countries kind of dominate others. Um, and that the real kind of answer, obviously, to this question, to this problem, is, uh, is socialism. But we can't, as those people who left uh, the, the organization in 2015 did, uh, we can't uh, abstractly counterpose socialism uh, to national liberation struggles, because they're often very deeply intertwined, really, the struggles. You know, we stand um, on the recognition of the right of self-determination, as, uh, as Lenin pointed out. Um, but we question for these countries how really can it be achieved in, in real kind of terms. Um, and obviously we say only under socialism can it really be achieved. Um, and you know, James Connolly in Ireland was an example in this regard uh, in saying you know, the, the, the cause of labour is the cause of Ireland and the cause of Ireland is the cause of labour. Pointing out how it deeply intertwined the questions of social liberation and national liberation had become in Ireland. Um, and James Connolly, a great example, you know, had very much the same ideas about the national question uh, as Lenin, even though they, they never met in, the, you know, in their lifetimes. Um, and he's known, of course, for expressing this, uh, his, his kind of policy, with his kind of famous quote about you know, raising the green flag over Dublin Castle. Um, but uh, you can do this, but England will still rule you through its capitalists, through its landlords and so on, showing that really uh, only... Through, uh, through socialist revolution can, uh, can self-determination or can national liberation uh, truly be, be, be meaningful. Um, that was his message to, um, to the working class of Ireland and to the, to the national movement there. Um, because this, uh, you know, the, the formal political independence um, of, you know, a, a newly independent country or an ex-colony or something like this, um, can be, uh, you know, contradicted by uh, the reality of, uh, of economic domination, like I said, um, in this uh, global kind of capitalist uh, market. This doesn't mean, however, like, I, that, uh, like to go back to the point earlier, I suppose, that we just kind of abandon the national question because it's uh, maybe an illusion under imperialism. Um, as, as Rosa Luxemburg argued, um, in, uh, in, in Lenin's kind of pamphlet, The Right of Nations to Self-Determination, that's where he takes up this question and takes up kind of Rosa Luxemburg's arguments and so on against it, which she essentially argued that, you know, that uh, because uh, national liberation under imperialism is, is kind of an illusion, it shouldn't be in a, in a Marxist program. But uh, Lenin rejected this because although this relationship of economic domination may, may still exist, um, the, the question is of political independence. And socialist revolution is at first a political question, and therefore there's a need to address it, essentially. And that's why Lenin fiercely defended the inclusion of the right of nations to self-determination in the Bolsheviks' uh, program, or in the program of the Russian Social Democrats, and uh, insisted um, that the, uh, the Comintern adopt a, simi a similar policy, of course, in the, in the 1920s towards uh, colonies and towards oppressed nations. Um, but uh, I think to return to like, the essence, really, of the question, um, which is uh, what builds the revolution, what conditions it, what makes it more likely. Uh, this is, I think, the kind of key uh, thing to have in your mind when we consider national questions in each kind of case. Um, it's essential that we can tell between what is reactionary and what is progressive. This is the, the fundamental point of our theories, right? If Marxism can't do that, then uh, it's really useless. Um, and Lenin, like Marx, wrote about the need to, uh, to draw out the progressive content of certain national questions uh, concretely defined. Um, you know, it was Marx who wrote 
about the need for the British working class, and uh, which was obviously more developed than the Irish working class, more you know, had much more uh, greater organisation and uh, much more um, uh, you know socialism, much more, much more of a force there. Um, the need of them to to imbue the uh, the Irish national question with a real revolutionary character, really, um, against the uh, you know to support the Irish workers uh, against even their own bourgeois, but ultimately uh, to to support this right of um, self determination, and. One of, the, uh, one of the many phrases, I think, that stood out in the, uh, the 2015 Congress that I attended was this idea that uh, nationalism can be uh, the outer shell of an immature Bolshevism. Kind of a straight, strange and striking thing to say. Um, this was Trotsky writing about Ukraine, in fact, about Ukrainian nationalism. I think today, uh, when we look at Ukrainian nationalism, we maybe would not say the same thing in large part. But, um, but uh, at the time, Essentially, uh, the, the, you know, Trotsky was dealing with this problem of, uh, of, of how to maintain the integrity of the Soviet Union when there was this, uh, this still this, uh, this, this feeling of, 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 of uh, or this desire for kind of national independence in Ukraine um, and how to deal with that. And, and thus he argued for, for an independent Soviet Ukraine in order, again, to clear the decks of centuries of national oppression of Russian workers by Ukrainian workers. Um, and uh, yeah, this, this phrase, you know, kind of shocking. It was kind of ridiculed somewhat, or, or they, they said it was being taken out of context at this 2015 Congress. Um, but the meaning of this, the meaning of this phrase uh, is, is that, uh, you know, the class struggle and the, the will of the working class to change society um, it can be expressed uh, not always uh, perfectly uh, or in a fully formed way. It can be expressed in all kinds of distorted and, and peculiar ways. And in fact, one of the most common ways is the national question, the desire for national liberation, independence, self-determination. Um, we know that consciousness in general is, uh, is, is kind of conservative. I think we stuck to time quite well, I'm about to sum up. Um, is, uh, is conservative, that it lags behind uh, events, but it's also very contradictory. You know, when you speak to workers in general, they hold very contradictory ideas in their minds at the same time. And uh, this is true, you know, I feel like uh, of Scotland, of people who, of people who you know, support independence, but are fully aware of uh, the fact that uh, you know, the, the SNP's like, program for independence is, is not a very progressive one. Um, but, uh, yeah. but, uh, but given this, I mean, it just means that uh, you know, we uh, you know, must, be, uh, must be flexible enough, basically, that we can accomplish our, our fundamental task which is uh, to build the Revolutionary Party, of course. We can do this under all conditions, even ones that are, uh, that are not ideal, ones that we wouldn't choose, you know, for example. Because if we could ignore the national question, if we could say, oh, it's not important, you know, we just want to focus on international class struggle, that would be ideal. But that's not the reality of the world that we live in, unfortunately. And we, thus, we do have to encounter it, and we do have to have a, a good position on it. Um, the national question, as Lenin recognized, I think, um, in his consideration of it from the point of view of world revolution, has uh, immense power to create uh, and to, to foster you know, revolutionary crises in countries. I think we definitely see that in Britain today, that a defining feature of the coming British Revolution will be this crisis of the union, as we write about in the paper, the national question in Scotland, the persistence of the national question, the problem of the border and partition of Ireland is causing chaos and, and he real headaches for the British ruling class. And they have no real solution to this Northern Ireland problem. And uh, they're, they're gearing up for uh, you know, quite a, quite a head-on fight, I think, over the Scottish national question. Um, but in this, uh, you know, this revolutionary crisis that uh, it provokes, um, we know that there's no other force. We don't need to worry about, uh, I think, reactionary nationalists and so on really taking over. Because really in this epoch, there's no other force other than the proletariat, uh, led by its most advanced section, that can challenge the entrenched uh, ruling class and take power into its own hands. And uh, it's for that reason that the national question, I think, has importance for us. And uh, I hope everyone will, uh, will has a lot of questions for their breakout sessions. And after today, is inspired to do some study and some reading in the national question, because it's a whole world of, uh, of, of, of theory. And uh, it will make you a better Marxist. So I think that is good.